them. Isla was raised in Miami Beach, Florida, the youngest of four sisters. She grew up near the ocean, and by 14, she'd met a surfer named Chris Marisick at a high school dance. He was my first boyfriend, and I fell madly in love with him. The romance lasted three years until Chris was drafted into the army to fight in Vietnam. At the same time, Isla discovered she was pregnant. She was 17. We were both really just kids, but things like that just don't go away if you don't tell anybody. Isla's parents decided it was best to keep the pregnancy a secret and admitted their daughter into one of the Florence Crittenton homes for unwed mothers, which cared for their patients until they gave birth and then arranged for the adoption of their children. I was missing Christopher immensely, and I was alone and scared. I knew I wasn't ready to be married. I didn't see how I could support a child and a, a wife. Did you think that Isla should put the baby up for adoption? I remember just wanting not to have to make a decision. I wanted to leave the decision to Isla. On August 9th, 1968, Isla gave birth to a baby boy after two days of labor that ended with a cesarean section. As she recovered in the Crittenden home, the only way she could see her son was through the glass of a hospital window. I would take my IV pole and go down to the nursery every chance I had. And I would look and stand there, but they wouldn't let me touch him. And they would hold him up. I think I must have stood there for hours. Isla felt bliss. Her only hope was to give a few clues so she must today find her son again. They had a portion on the form that said what my occupation was and the father and I made something up I said um, that I was a hairstylist and the father was an oceanographer and the adoptive parents got this information they on did. the form why did you do it these were my crumbs in the forest to find him someday Isla's son was adopted three weeks after his birth, but she could never discover what had happened to him. Chris Marisick returned from Vietnam and married Isla. A year later, they had a daughter they named Carrie, but the marriage ended in divorce. Through it all, Isla could not forget the son she had given up. When I would see a one-year-old or a two-year-old, I'd look at an eyebrow or a nose or a smile, thinking, is that you? Is that you? After the divorce, Isla and her daughter moved to Westchester, New York, where she established herself as a successful jewelry designer. Carrie had been told she was an only child, but for some reason, it never rang true. I always felt um, that there was something else in my life that wasn't there, something was incomplete. Did you wonder if there was someone out there like you? Always. At the same time, unknown to Carrie, her brother Ben, six years older, was being raised in North Carolina by the couple who had adopted both him and a baby girl they named Margot. Ben Davis grew up knowing he'd been adopted, but not even his parents knew the identity of Ben's birth mother. Only the few scraps of information left on the birth records. While I was in high school, I took a test to determine what I was going to be when I grew up. <laughs> and one of the... Uh, options that I was given was an oceanographer and my dad's jaw dropped and he's like that's remarkable because on when we were adopting you we found out that your father was an oceanographer by the time Carrie was 17 she was back in touch with her father Chris and on one of her visits he suddenly let the truth slip out I started telling her about you know our life uh, and how we had put a child up for adoption six years before she was born right I said what what did you say she said that she you know always knew there was something another part of her somewhere that she was missing and immediately this feeling that i had to find him immediately but part of the reason carrie's mother had never told the secret was to spare her daughter the years she had already spent trying to find her son florida adoption records are sealed by state law i just didn't have the heart to totally tell her carrie this is never 
going to happen. I have tried, and I have pretty much given up. But Carrie would not give up. She called a private investigator, registered with adoption agencies, and searched the internet every week. Carrie, you really obsessed. Yeah. With finding your brother. I was convinced that I would find him and that he would be just like me and that I would have a brother. And I always imagined that this person would somehow walk into my life by accident. But the brother Carrie so longed for was 3,000 miles away in San Francisco, working and going to school. He had once tried to find his birth family, but hit the same roadblocks in Florida law. Ben Davis thought it was simply meant to happen. I had a, a great family growing up, and I always figured that for whatever reason that my uh, my birth family had given me up, it was a good reason and I didn't want to bother them. Harry, meanwhile, had followed her mother into the jewelry business and had established a career in New York City. Despite her success, she felt a restless urge to travel to, of all places, San Francisco. And I couldn't figure out why, because I didn't particularly love the city. You just felt you had to live in this feeling. It was time I had to I said, just throw it off the wind, pick up, move across the country where I knew two people. I had no place to go. <laughs> In San Francisco, Carrie found a roommate named Erin Kehoe. I was dating Carrie's best friend from New York who lived here, and Carrie came to visit him, and we hit it off right away. Carrie started to meet some of Erin's friends, and last July, at a night spot called the Cats Club, Erin introduced Carrie to an old friend of hers, Ben Davis. But neither Erin nor Carrie had any idea that it was Carrie's brother. Two weeks later, the girls invited Ben along to a casual dinner, and in the middle of the meal, Erin suddenly asked Carrie a question that would change their lives. 